Again, spirited singing, thank you. Please be seated. Take a copy of the New Testament and open to the book of Acts. If you slipped away this morning and left that familiar Bible by the bedside, there is a pew Bible directly in front of you. We always want to encourage careful attention to what is taught. We serially, that is in series, uh, teach through consecutive uh, consecutively through books of the Bible, we have arrived at the last section of Acts chapter 27. So our reading this morning is Acts chapter 27, uh, verses 33 through the chapter's conclusion at verse 44. Next week, happily, after uh, several years in the book of Luke Acts, that is the two volumes that Luke composed and sent to Theophilus, uh, these books uh, will end beginning next week in chapter 28, so we're making our way uh, toward the end of a, a very profitable journey. And this morning we have a, a view of Paul as he sits amidst the Greco-Roman culture, how his public conduct affected those on the ship, and to suggest from that that even though our world is troubled and divided, we nevertheless have opportunity in public to be a witness to the grace of God and the promises of salvation through Jesus Christ. So let's begin and read through the concluding verses of chapter 27. We're still on board, but almost ready to quite literally jump ship. Verse 33, chapter 27. Until the day was about to dawn, Paul was encouraging them all to take some food. He said to them, Today is the fourteenth day that you have been constantly watching and going without eating, having taken nothing. Therefore, I encourage you to take some food, for this is for your preservation, for not a hair from the head of any of you will perish. Having said this, he took bread, gave thanks to God in the presence of all, broke it, and began to eat. All of them were encouraged, and they themselves also took food. All of us in the ship were 276 persons. When they had eaten enough, they began to lighten the ship by throwing out the wheat into the sea. When day came, they could not recognize the land but they did observe a bay with a beach, and they resolved to drive the ship onto it if they could. Casting off the anchors, they left them in the sea, while at the same time they were loosening the ropes of the rudders and hoisting the foresail to the wind. They were heading for the beach. But striking a reef where two seas met, they ran the vessel aground, the prow stuck fast and remained immovable, but the stern began to be broken up by the force of the waves. The soldiers' plan was to kill the prisoners so that none of them would swim away and escape. But the centurion, wanting to bring Paul safely through, kept them from their intention and commanded that those who could swim should jump overboard first and get to land, and the rest should follow, some on planks, others on various things from the ship. And so it happened that they all were brought safely to land. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his infallible word. Well, it is still in the early hours of the morning of the 14th day. They, we learned last week, that is the sailors and the total number of persons on board being 276, the sailors perceived apparently by resounding waves striking the rocks on the shore of Malta, that at last, 
14 days after they left Fair Haven in Crete, they now appear to be nearing land which would bring to them preservation from what had appeared to be certain death. So we learned that the sailors put out a lead weight as a fathom measurement and indeed with two measurements detected that they were coming close to shore. As a result, they put out four floating sea anchors that seems to steady the ship and slow the ship's progress so that they may await daybreak and see where they can land the ship, at least in hope of doing so safely. And so we also read of the unhappy incident in which in a furtive and clandestine effort, the crew decides to abandon ship and they take the skiff, the dinghy, the lifeboat, lower it and begin to enter it when Paul says to the centurion, if these men leave the ship, you cannot be saved. And we identified this from the Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 5, paragraphs 2 and 3, that God uses ordinary means to fulfill his providential will. And quoting that, we saw that it was the sailor's seamanship that would bring to pass the promise that an angel of God had given to Paul that all hands on deck would survive. They would arrive safely on land. This a prophetic revelation to Paul by an angel in the night that had been communicated to the people on board. And in this instance, the sailors disbelieved the revelation, sought to escape, leaving helplessly on board the other passengers headed for the rocks into which they would crash, bringing certain death to those on board. So that's where we are, but we've now spent another hour or two, and when we come to verse 23, we are poised on board the storm-tossed ship just before the dawn breaks. But remember, clouds have covered in the storm, the nor'easter, as the Greco-Romans called it, that clouds covered so that they could not navigate by sun or by stars. And so the Early morning light is just about to at least bring some luminosity so that they can see the shore and hopefully identify a place and run the ship aground, leave the ship, and dramatically and miraculously be delivered from drowning and death. At this time, to elaborate somewhat on what we find, Paul becomes... A, an actor again on center stage. He has already cautioned them about the journey at the beginning. He has already given a revelation that God granted to him because of his prayer that all on board would be safe. But now Paul does something, I think, to our modern culture, our professing Christian culture uh, in our Uh, in in Christendom, instead of giving to the shipmates a charge of salvation, that is, we are near death, Christ has died for our sins, repent and believe, Paul takes an altogether different tact. Beginning in verse 33, it says, until the day was about to dawn, Paul was encouraging them all to take food. And then Luke goes on in the succeeding verse to tell us that for 14 days from Fairhaven to Malta, 14 days of storm-tossed sea travel, that during that period of time, the people had been so anxiety-ridden, motion sickness may be familiar to some of you as it is to me, and 
not only ridden by the anxiety of potential death at sea, but storm-tossed, their appetite had gone to nil. But Paul, instead of echoing an invitation to salvation, tells them that there are strenuous activities ahead. They are going to disembark from the ship and have to swim to shore. And in order to gain strength for that, they should take food. Perhaps we could just reduce it to say this, Paul looked after the immediate and practical needs of his fellow shipmates rather than using this particular occasion to give a word of salvation testimony. Instead, he tells them, I have encouraged you to take some food, verse 34, for this is your preservation, for not a hair of your head shall perish. The word preservation is a translation of the word soteria, which is ordinarily translated salvation. And Paul is saying much of what we've said from the confession, that God in his ordinary promises uses means. And the passengers taking food is a means to a live outcome in this particular endeavor. So I think it does remind us that when we are as Christians conspicuously set apart in our culture as Paul, Aristarchus, and Luke appear to be the only three Christians on board. But when we are set apart as distinct in our culture, that it may not be that we are acting precisely as we should simply to give a word of salvation, but rather to address the needs that were pressing upon the people's minds, anxious, perhaps nearing death, rocks resounding in the crashing surf, and perhaps many of them later will learn could not even swim. Paul says, what lies ahead of you will be strenuous, the most useful information, and the most practical encouragement that I can give to you. Encouragement is mentioned three times in these short verses. The most practical advice I can give, the most encouraging endeavor that you can make at this point is to take and eat food for your preservation. Strenuous times lie ahead. So it is that we, as a church in our witness, often seek to meet the immediate practical pressing needs of individuals as a means thereby of communicating the love of God and having an open door then in time to share with them the good news of Jesus Christ and his salvation. Paul not only tells them to take food, he himself breaks bread. It is not a Eucharistic celebration for Paul, Aristarchus, and Luke. It is Paul's example that he takes food, breaks bread, gives public thanks to God as Jesus did, and then distributes the bread among a roll call of 276 people. Paul says here um, uh, that all of the scripture says, excuse me, verse 36, all of them were encouraged. They themselves also took food. Then were given in verse 37 the roll call. Apparently at first light, the powers that be, the lieutenants and the captain of the ship, believe it profitable to take a roll call so that when they do reach the beach in the providence of God, they would be able to determine if all hands had indeed been saved. Or alternatively, it may have been a measurement to see how much food was needed. As soon as that food is consumed, verse 38 tells us, confirming other interpretations, that they took the cargo that remained and tossed the wheat, which is identified with the cargo, 
Wheat and cargo are synonymous. The wheat is tossed into the sea. Back in verse 18 of this same chapter, we know that some of the cargo had been jettisoned. But a hundred foot ship would ordinarily carry, and we've estimated that as the usual size of a Roman ship carrying grain to Rome from Alexandria, and we trace the trip from Alexandria to Myra to Asia Minor to Crete, and now after the 14 days of storm to Malta. But what we did learn is several things. First of all, they jettisoned most of the cargo, but kept some of it for what some of you will know for ballast in the ship's hold so that the ship would have a counterbalance to the waves. It was kept for ballast. Now, however, they are going to run the ship aground or try to into the bay and onto the beach. They are going to jettison the remaining cargo so that the boat will not draw as much water and it will make its way into the very shallowest part without encumbering itself with the materials that may have been submerged as the ship makes its way to shore. It lightens the boat, raises it in the water, the ship draws less water and is therefore more mobile in shallow waters. One perhaps interesting figure, the estimate of the number of bags of grain, we've said the ship, ships were ordinarily in the 100 foot range or exceeding that. We've said that they usually carried 250 to 300 tons of grain as they make their way from Alexandria to Myra, eventually to Syracuse in Sicily, and then on to the Western Roman coast to Rome. Well, that amount of wheat, 250 to 300 tons, would take in excess of 7,000 bags to contain that grain. So you can imagine the effort that was required to lighten the boat. And apparently it is not only the ship's crew, but it is also the passengers that have to set to and make as much work of the remaining ballast of wheat cargo in the ship to lighten it so that it can come in closer to shore and escape running aground in the water. Well, we're just not given much more than to say that they made that effort, but it certainly would give us a mental pic picture of three things that take place in verse 40. But before just listing those, let's remember that the crew earlier in the wee hours of the morning had made an attempt, a furtive attempt, to jump ship, to leave the passengers helpless aboard a ship tossing and turning in a violent storm. So, however, when the soldiers cut the rope to the dinghy or the lifeboat or the skiff, whichever one we would want to use to describe it, they realize, that is the sailors realize, that they are now on board permanently with the crew and the fate of the passengers and the fate of the crew are identified together. They are all going to suffer whatever fate is going to come to pass. Perhaps some of them did, did embrace Paul's words that God would bring them all safely to land. But ship crew and passengers are now all shipmates with the same destiny. So these men now become the means, Westminster Confession of Faith, the means of God carrying out his ordinary providence. His ordinary promise is unchangeable and immutable, we learned, but he carries it out by the means. And the means in verse 40 are three skillful activities of the seamen, the sea crew, 
the ship's crew that the boat would have been without had they left in the lifeboat, left the ship without the expertise and knowledge of the ship's crew. And they do three things. And again, it's found in verse 40. They cast off the anchors. Previously, last week we learned, again, they put out four floating sea anchors to impede the ship from going closer into shore where they're hearing the surf crash against the rocks. So not wanting in the dark, not wanting to run on the rocks, they cast out four stern anchors. Now those stern anchors are cut loose. They wish to progress forward toward the shore. Light has come. They see a bay and they see a beach. Into the bay, onto the beach is the goal. The seamen know that the four anchors are impeding the progress of the ship. They cut them loose, first thing they do. Second thing they do, which says, while at the same time they were loosening the low ropes of the rudders in a violent storm, the ship's rudders were often taken up onto the deck or lashed down to keep from moving in the surf that is violently stirred with the storm. Why? Because these rudders, some call them sea paddles, would be broken off in the violent storm. They would be without any way, virtually, to direct the ship if those rudders were lost in the storm. So, although we did not know it, the sailors on the ship had brought them up aboard and lashed them down on the ship. There was a rudder for the port, or the left side, and the starboard, or the right side. Each side had a sea paddle or a rudder. Now the crew drops them both down in to the water and secures them. One port, one on the starboard. There are two. There is a drawbar that connects the two in order for a helmsman to steer the boat. In other words, with that drawbar connecting the two rudders, he is able to guide the rudders uh, in synchrony and be able to stir, stir the ship. So the impediment of the sea, anchors is gone, sea anchor is gone. The restoration of navigation by rudders is restored. And the skill of the seamen in doing those two things are the means whereby the ship is going to be saved. The third thing, beside the expertise of the sailor who was the helmsman, knowing how to handle the drawbar and the rudders, the third thing they do is they hoist the foresail. And the foresail is a small sail in the front of the ship with its own mast that does not provide much square footage, so therefore it does not gather as much wind. The mainsail, of course, ordinarily would be the main means of gathering wind to propel the, the ship forward. But long ago they had taken down not only the foresail, but the boom of the foresail and cast it overboard. However, with their skill and intelligence and expertise, the seamen know that they can somewhat navigate with the foresail. If wind goes into that foresail, they can maneuver the boom at the same time as they, as they move the drawbar, and between the drawbar and the rudders and the lightly propelled ship moving forward by the foresail, they can actually navigate the ship. The point being here is Paul's previous warning that if the seamen left the ship, they would not be saved. Verse 40 confirms why that is true. They had the ability and competence to be a helmsman, to drop the rudders, to cut the sea anchors, to hoist and manage the foresail so that the ship now by means 
of the expertise of what we believe to be non-Christian Egyptian sailors, these are the means by which God's providence, his revelation to Paul that the ship would safely strike an island and that all passengers on board would be saved. And so this is the fulfillment of Paul's words of revelation given to him by God on a previous night that God's means would be the way in which his providence, which is immutable and unchangeable, will bring this to pass. And we return to that thought because what it reminds Reformed Christians that our actions are highly significant because it is by our actions that much of the providence of God, which is immutable and unchangeable, comes to pass. Well, yesterday we had a wonderful work day led by our brother Dave and and particularly serviced by so many ladies and gentlemen of the church. We were able to accomplish much. And so one might say, in the providence of God, the exterior of the church will be cleaned by the time that Davis and Eileen wed on November 2nd. The church is, well, we can't say spiffied up, but maybe we will just say that. So the church, the exterior now has been pressure washed and cleaned. And we might say in the providence of God that has happened in time for Davis and Eileen to wed in a church that has a clean exterior. But the means by which in the providence of God the church will be clean... The means were men and women setting aside undoubted responsibilities during their day yesterday, putting a priority on the campus as a good testimony and witness to be clean and orderly. They set aside that their other responsibilities, came to the church, brought the equipment, stayed all day, and by ordinary means cleaned the exterior of the church, hung new lights, trimmed the shrubbery, which is forever needing it, it seems. And all of these things took place because people put the concern for witness and cleanliness as a priority. And by the means, particularly of several men's ability, the church is now clean on its exterior and so someone comes in and says, hey, in the providence of God, it's the church is clean for Davis and Eileen's wedding. God, in his ordinary providence, a quote from paragraph 3 of chapter 5 of the Confession of Faith. God, in his ordinary providence, makes use of means. And the means quite ordinarily, are the obedient actions of God's people. And therefore, the Reformed faith does not deny action or means or what paragraph 2 calls secondary causes, but our means and the secondary causes of God's providence coming to pass are confirmed by providence and brought into execution as we obey God in his work. We might say in the providence of God, the gospel went to Burma. But unless Adoniram Judson and others had gotten aboard a ship and gone there, without the means, the providence of God is, uh, the, the sense of the providence of God coming to pass is invalidated because of the failure of individuals to do what God ordains. So God's providence is immutable and unchangeable. It's going to come to pass. But it comes to pass in the ordinary sequence of events by Christians obeying God's will. And this gives our, whether it's 
hauling a bag of wheat and tossing it overboard, whether it's helping hoist a foresail, whatever it may be, our actions are significant. And of all Christians, Reformed Christians should be interested in obeying God's Word and being the means whereby He accomplishes His immutable and unchangeable providence. Now back to Paul. We have Paul move from a previous chapter where he is a chained prisoner having made an appeal to Festus. He, Festus the the Roman governor of Judea, he is a chained prisoner. Because of his faith and because of his encouraging words to the people on the ship, he has become by his example of thanking God and partaking of food, Paul has become the leader of the ship. And I would suggest that a faithful witness in public is a means whereby Christians can be leaders in their community. Paul is impelled forward by his faith that the ship will be saved as God has promised. Encouraged by that, He encourages others to eat and to prepare for the fulfillment of God's promise. He gives an example of eating himself. And now, as it appears, the ship is making its way toward the beach. The prow of the ship probably first engages land with mud and then probably then sticks in the underlying clay constituency of the bottom of the what is in in some Bibles it's translated reef. My New American Standard has reef. The New International Version seemingly more accurately to my mind has sandbar, certainly something that people could uh, grasp. Uh, The New Living Translation, um, sort of a paraphrase, has shoals. But here it has, in verse 41, they strike a reef where two seas meet, they run the vessel aground. Two seas apparently at the entrance to the bay, Uh, the currents clash, there is the formation of a sandbar or a shoal, the ship goes into this, probably engaging mud first, then sticking in the clay, And the foreship is intact with all passengers moving to the foreship, but the stern and the back of the ship is being pounded by waves. And after two weeks at sea, it's beginning to break apart. When I say two weeks at sea, I also need to include, I think, for your uh, learning of the length of this travel, from Fairhaven in Crete, where they left, to Malta is 476 miles. They have been at sea in a deadly storm for 14 days and 476 miles, and the ship is ready to break apart. And when they ground the ship on the sandbar or shoal or reef, whatever, it's, it's obviously a shallow area where the ship sticks. The ship is not in condition to take the beating of the waves and the back of the ship, what we might call the, the stern of the ship, begins to break up under the pounding of the waves. Well, we've not talked about them, but remember the prisoners who are with Paul. We have said that probably they view the trip to Rome as an unhappy occasion. They're probably destined to uh, a very unfortunate fate. The soldiers who guard them, to whom they are chained, know this. We know from chapter 12 of the book of Acts that Herod King Grippa I put James Zebedee to death and was going to put Peter to death when an angel rescued him. That's from our study of Acts chapter 12. And Luke told us that when they found that Peter was gone, the soldiers who had guarded Peter were led away. And that were led away 
almost certainly refers to being led away to execution. So the soldiers are charged with the responsibility of these prisoners, and if the prisoners escape, the soldiers are held responsible for the escape, and it brings about capital punishment. So understandably, much like the self-centered crew, the soldiers feel if these prisoners jump overboard and escape, then we are going to be held liable even on pain of our life. So they decide that they're going to put the prisoners, as some men and women begin to jump from the ship and make their way toward the shore, they decide that the soldier, the soldiers decide that they will put the prisoners to death. But Paul's presence and testimony and witness and integrity as he has been, become a leader on the ship by revelation and by example, Julius, the centurion whom we met earlier, Julius tells the soldiers not to take the lives of the prisoners because he wants to spare Paul. So Paul becomes not only the benefactor to an entire passenger, or to all the passengers and all the shipmates by God hearing his prayer, chapter 27, verse 24, God has heard his prayer, God has given to him his shipmates. That is to say, not only will Paul not be, not be lost at sea, but his shipmates will also be saved. Paul is not only the providential means whereby the entire cast of passengers is delivered, but specifically now, because of Paul, because a Christian is on board and in jeopardy, God has so ordered Julius's thoughts about Paul that even the prisoners' lives are spared when the soldiers sought to put them to death. Apparently, <clears throat> as the soldiers uh, ready to exit the ship by jumping over, um, apparently they unlock the manacles that hold the prisoners, let them swim to shore as well. And the concluding verse, <coughs> pardon me, the concluding verse, number 44, tells us that whether by the ability to swim or by grabbing hold of planks, and or floatsome, everyone, in sort of a dramatic conclusion to this dramatic episode, Luke says, and so it happened that they all were brought safely to land. By the way, just an aside, and then we're going to conclude with a thought about Paul and public Christianity. In the 19th century, it's dependence on memory, but I think it was Henry Ward Beecher, Congregationalist minister in Brooklyn, who delivered a famous sermon on verse 44. And he approached the text, chapter 27, and the entire sea voyage and shipwreck, he approached them allegorically. And I only mention this uh, to illustrate the kind of ingenuity and creativity that is possible at times with Scripture. Um, he, he used Malta, the island to which they were going to swim, as a picture of heaven. And he pictured Christians as the individuals who, whether by swimming or whether by floatsome, would eventually arrive at the kingdom of God in heaven. So he sort of uh, allegorized and dramatized uh, this event. They all were on the ship of journey in this earth, and then they jump off and in the providence of God, whether by floatsam or uh, planks broke from the broken up hull and stern of the ship or by swimming, they all come safely to land. And of course, the grand finale is God is going to deliver us all as Christians to the promised land. And of course, that's true enough. Uh, but uh, that's an example of how some of these texts may be used, and I, the sermon probably was inspirational to many people. 
But I think what we really want to learn here is, particularly in the day in which we live when we are almost coward, C-O-W-E-R-E-D, we almost cower before this seemingly monolithic culture of unbelief, of, uh, of profane secularism. And we feel that there may be little, if any way, to give a credible witness of the salvation that is in Jesus Christ to such an overwhelming uh, cultural presence of secularity and unbelief. But what we have here as we conclude this chapter is Paul, uh, he does have Aristarchus and Luke with him, although they are not mentioned, but earlier mentioned as passengers. What we have here is an example of a man who is alike, of like passion, such as we and Elijah are, but a man who is faithful in a very delicate situation. He arises to a position of leadership whereby not only does he take bread, give thanks, and encourages them, the text tells us that they too became encouraged. So a Christian who is walking in the midst of our troubled times, but is, who is able to retain exemplary faith and confidence and courage in the face of whether it be financial markets or social tension or ideological conflict or whatever particular characteristic of modern American life we might choose, an individual who, like Paul on board this ship, is vastly un outnumbered. If Aristarchus and Luke are the only other Christians, it's three believers and 273 non-believers. So, and yet, the faithful Christian who walks in integrity, who takes God's word as being authoritative and uh, that to which we are to submit, and lives it out in a public way, he rises to a position of leadership, number one. And number two, he is the providential means whereby the ship's culture, if we could put it that way, is delivered from death. It may be I, you, none of us has access to the secret providence of God. But some reason, perhaps correctly, that because of providence and the hundreds, we hope thousands of Bible-believing churches like our own, because of the presence of praying Christians in this country, God has withheld the judgment that appropriately and deservedly should fall on this country for any number of reasons, whether it be the taking of innocent unborn lives or the public uh, display of sodomy or whatever other of the transgressions and infidelities and um, abominations that take place in modern American culture, why has God not brought about a final judgment? And indeed he may. We don't know the mind of God on that. But it very well may be that we are highly significant, though small in number, three Christians versus 260, 73 apparently unbelieving people, though we are in a small minority, a small conservative Bible-believing Reformed church, but there are hundreds and undoubtedly thousands of others across our country that God is sparing the ship, if you will, because the providences of this world are praying. And we are here asking God, just as Paul asked for the lives of those on the ship, we are here three times a week praying to God that God would stay his hand of judgment and God would deliver our nation, overturn Roe versus Wade, bring a sane view 
of the genders back, a biblical worldview that once was dominant in our culture. So this passage, whereas Paul does not give preachments about salvation immediately, his presence elevates him to leadership and his presence prevents the destruction and death of 273 people on board that ship. And just as Jonah was thrown overboard and God dealt with the ship accordingly, here Paul stays on board and God deals with the ship accordingly. So we do have not only a public witness in courage and faith, but we also have a presence that may itself be the means whereby God preserves our culture from certain death under the judgment of God. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for these interesting stories, but they are illustrative of your providence, your care not only for the three believers, but your mercy to the prisoners whose lives were spared, to the shipmates whose lives were spared, and Paul now, uh, assuming a place of leadership among them, brings glory to you by way of witness. Help us, Lord, to be courageous in a, uh, though we are in a small minority, and we pray that you would help us to be courageous and faithful, good examples, encouraging to others who have no hope. And we pray that by our constant prayers for the preservation of the lives of innocent unborn children, for the return to appropriate morality in the relationships of life, for the desecration of the Lord's Day and all the other uh, crimes against the law of God that are rife in our nation. We pray that we may be salt and light and may by our testimony preserve the culture at large that it may come to faith and receive the forgiveness of God. We make our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.